So good morning. I'm so glad that you are all at our fifth annual NOW conference today. How many of you, this is your first one? Most of you. How many have been to two? Three. Anybody who's been to all of them? No, oh, okay, good. Well, I'm so glad to have you all at the conference today. I'm on the conference planning committee. Um, so a lot of great work has gone into your day and I hope you're having a great day already so far. I think we kicked it off with a wonderful keynote with our chancellor this morning. Um, and I'm really happy to have you joining me for my session today on the future of learning. My name is Inette Dishler and I am a senior learning and development specialist with our staff learning and development team in Central Human Resources. And I've been on campus almost 17 years and have been fortunate enough to work on a, a wide variety of learning and development programs for our staff over all those years. Um, I have a passion for helping people learn and grow and particularly our staff here on campus. Um, and so I study learning and look at what are the trends in learning, how are people learning, um, to think about how we in the learning and development group need to be thinking about the work that we do for all of you and how we can best support your learning needs as staff on our campus. So that is really what led me to do this session on the future of learning is from really doing a lot of research and studying into how is it people are learning now. Um, was anybody in my session two years ago when we introduced the Wisdom Cafe for the first time? We had, it was brand new at that point? Great, because there's a couple things I covered then that I'm going to do again, and they won't be repeats for you. So um, I'd like to begin with two quotes. And the first one is, far more valuable than knowledge is the ability to learn new things and apply those learnings to new scenarios and environments. The employee of the future needs to focus on learning to learn. This is a quote from Jacob Morgan, who his job title is futurist. I don't think we have those job titles here on our campus. But I want to share a second quote that says a recent Pew Research Center survey suggested that the most valuable skills in the future will be those that machines can't yet easily replicate, like creativity, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, adaptability, and collaboration. In short, people need to learn how to learn. Now, what do those two quotes have in common? Hmm? Learning to learn, that's right. So two quotes, very different sources talk that came from um, different fields, still talking about the need to learn to learn. So how do we learn today? The primary way that people learn today is social learning. Social learning is what happens outside of the formal structure of a classroom. It happens every day. It happens all the time. It happens through your networks, through your colleagues, through social media and technology, through the people that we meet and the experiences that we have on and off the job. It centers around sharing, collaboration, and co-creation. Now, if you take this concept that social learning is what's happening, we're engaged in it all the time on various levels of being conscious of doing that or not, um, if you take that concept and you apply it in a workplace setting, you have social business. And social business is when you have people connected to other people, to information and insights within an organization. And then you apply the learnings to improve performance and achieve organizational goals. Now, how many of you have ever found out about an app? Think of all the apps you have on your phone or your mobile device. Ever found out about an app that you love, you use all the time, from a friend, from your kid, from somebody else? Okay, almost everybody in the room. Okay, that's social learning. How many of you have ever found out about a tool that you use to do your job, maybe a project management tool, a productivity tool, some kind of tool that you found out about from a colleague or a coworker that really makes a difference for you to be able to do your job well. Okay, again, almost every hand in the room goes up. That's social business. So we are always learning with others, informally in our personal lives, as well as formally um, and informally in our work lives. Um, and that is a process that we want to think about more and how do we facilitate social learning. So 
First, I'd like you to pair up with somebody, because to be social, you need to have a network and know people. So pair up with somebody, preferably somebody you don't know already, um, who's sitting near you, and introduce yourselves, and answer these two questions. An example of an app, an extension, a widget, something like that, that you found out about from somebody else that you use personally, something on your phone. Um, and then also an example of something, a tool that you use at work that you learned about from somebody else. So what are two tools? One personal that you just really like, this app that you use all the time, you could turn somebody else onto, maybe they don't know about it, and a tool that you find really helpful. Introduce yourselves and share those two examples each. So now I'd like to talk about I hope you find out about some cool apps and tools just in that brief little exchange. Um, I'd like to talk about the advantages of social learning. Why are we even talking about this now? And there's already been a lot of research on social learning that points out some clear advantages. One is that it supports continuous learning. So we all want to, in our own lives, be continuous learners, be learning on a regular basis, and not just in our jobs, but in our lives. And social learning helps you to do that because you have 24-7 access to all kinds of channels and sources and resources that can help us learn. It also helps learning retention. So there's some evidence already that it improves learning retention. Um, it's partly because of the ways people are learning socially um, and partly because of the immediacy and the relevancy of the information that you're finding that you're learning from that you retain it better. It helps you to be more productive because you can get answers to questions that you have, information you need, right when you need it. And then you're not losing time or doing things wrong and then having to go back and do them again. It promotes higher engagement. So we know that one of the top three engagement drivers is continuous learning and growth. People want opportunities to learn and to grow and have challenging opportunities as part of their job. And that is a big driver of being engaged at work. And the more you are engaged in a social learning process, the more engagement you feel. It keeps you better informed because there are so many channels that you can get information from now that didn't used to exist in the past. We're still not so great about using them all on our campus, but we're working on that and hopefully that'll get better. Um, and it builds connection and collaboration. So we, of course, are a very siloed organization and we're very spread out geographically. And so it's hard to get to know people, even people that you work with in some kind of way trying to do your job, you might never even have seen or met those people because they're in another building or in another uh, control unit or in, in another part of the city. So um, we have a, a challenging organization in that sense to build connection and social learning, social work, um, can help us to do that. So there are four key concepts of social learning that I want to talk to you about in this session. So this is a brief introduction for the time that I have to these four concepts, and I hope that you learn enough about them that it makes you curious and you want to explore more about them later on your own. So the four I'm going to talk about today are PKM. It's known as Personal Knowledge Management. And this is from a man named Harold Jarkey, J-A-R-C-H-E, if you want to look into that some more. We'll also talk about personal learning networks, or PLNs, and I'm going to show you a short video about that. We're going to talk about curation, which is a really hot topic right now, and also about blogging. So let's start with PKM. PKM is based on these three skills, seeking, sensing, and sharing knowledge. Seeking knowledge answers the question, what do I want to learn or what do I need to know? And we all come across things all the time that we're dealing with trying to do our jobs that then it's like, well, now I don't know how to do this or there's some piece of information that's missing. And so you have to know how to go get that answer. You can't wait until there's a training class that might be six months from now. Um, maybe you don't have any coworkers around you who know the answer. You need to get the answer. And so how do you seek out that knowledge? We have to know the sources that are available to us to go to. What's the number one search engine in the world? What's the number two search engine in the world? YouTube. YouTube. So people are going to search engines. They're going to Google and YouTube before they're going to their manager to be the knowledge expert for them in their jobs. You will, it's much quicker and you trust that source and you will Google to find out something you need to know. So those are great sources, but you have to expand that repertoire and know where else can you seek knowledge from. The next is sensing knowledge. 
This answers the question, what is the value and meaning of this? Now, we are inundated 24-7 now with information. It comes at us from so many different sources, especially if you're on social media. You're getting things sent to you. We have a lot of push information that comes at us, tons of email. And a lot of it is useless. A lot of it is not of value to what we need right now. As Ernest Hemingway used to say, he needed an automatic built-in crap detector. Well, in Ernest Hemingway's day, there was no social media. There was not even all this technology. So imagine how much more crap we get exposed to than he did. And we have to have a way to tell what's useful to us and what's not. What's real news and what's fake news? So sensing knowledge is really about learning how to filter out what's not helpful to us and figure out of all the sources that we have, what are our trusted sources, our go-to sources, that have the information that is useful and meaningful to us. Now, the third skill in PKM is sharing knowledge. And this is really where learning gets social. Because sharing knowledge is really about answering this question, what can I offer? So I can get a lot out in the world. There's all kinds of stuff coming to me. But what can I put back out there? What do I have to share? And in various platforms and on various topics, what do you know that your colleagues on campus might benefit from? We all have expertise. We have our own skills. We have experience. Um, we have our tools and the ways we do our job. We have a lot that we can share. And so that is a third critical skill set of personal knowledge management and social learning is sharing knowledge. So now I'm going to show you a short video about personal learning networks, or PLNs. A personal learning network, or PLN, is a way of describing the group of people and sometimes organizations you connect with in order to learn from their ideas, their questions, their reflections, and their references. Your PLN is not limited to online interactions, but it is that online global interactive part that really makes it special. It is personal because you choose who's part of that group. Because you choose if you want to lurk, just check out what people are saying, or if you want to share. Because you choose when to do so and how to do so. You don't have to know the people in your PLN personally. Their contribution to your learning focus is what brought you together through the internet. It is a network because these people are in turn connected to other people and organizations that influence and enrich the interactions of your group through various collaboration tools, usually referred to as Web 2.0. It is focused on learning. For instance, the learning I'm focused on in my PLN is professional development and education. I follow people who have interest in pedagogy, didactics, and technology, and I offer them some of my thoughts on the matter in various forms. How do you engage with your PLN? The tools vary from one person to another. My personal favorites are Twitter, YouTube, and the Educator's PLN. Your PLN is always on, but you don't have to be always on it. Take what you want, offer what you want, when you want, where you want it, and on whichever device you prefer. This keeps learning, or your professional development, always easily accessible. So you want to use your network to ask and answer questions for other people, your colleagues, to share ideas and resources and experiences. One of the things we have a really hard time finding out about on this campus is best practices that already exist in various departments. And so it, some department, let's say they want to start a staff recognition program, and they don't know if there already are recognition programs that other departments are running that are already working really well. And so there's no way to find that out. And so they start over, and they reinvent the wheel, and they try to build something from scratch. That's a lot of wasted time and effort. Um, so the more you have a network that you can share, or platforms where you can share these ideas and your successes, it benefits everybody. You also want to use your network to solve problems and brainstorm together. I teach a lot of classes in the Keys program for supervisors and managers. And invariably, when uh, any supervisor in the class is brave enough to say, this is a problem that I'm struggling with, there are always other people in the room who are currently or have struggled with that same thing. Our problems are not unique. But we need to share our solutions to those problems. Because some people are struggling with something right now that you've already figured out. It helps us to keep up with what our colleagues are doing and thinking, both our internal and external colleagues, and to learn from colleagues in many different ways. And it's important to make sure that your network is broad and diverse. Now, this is a simple matrix to help you think about who is in your network. And this matrix, on the left, we have 
pers or internal on the bottom and external on the top. And on the bottom matrix, we have axis rather, we have personal on the left and professional on the right. I'm going to walk you through these four boxes. And what you would do is write the names of key people for you that represent that box. At least five names in each box. So you can draw this for yourself, and there's no taking pages in your um, brochure from today, or if you have other paper, that's fine. Um, you can draw this and just write, write down your own name. So let's start in the bottom left, the light blue box, which is internal and personal. So the names you want to put here are the people that you go to inside of our organization, maybe in your own department, for personal things. These are the people that really know who you are in the world. You share personal things with them. You have lunch with them. You celebrate each other's birthdays. Maybe you get together even outside of work. So inside of our organization, your personal go-to people. Do you have friends at work? Not that that's required. If you go up from there, we're sticking with personal, but now we go to the external. So who in your life are your key go-to people that really know who you are in the world, that you share your most personal things with, that you go to to solve problems that you're struggling with, um, that you feel safe with? So outside of the campus, but still personal. Who are those key people for you in your life? Significant others, family members, friends. Now let's move over to the right side. And on the top in the yellow box, we have who are the people still outside of the organization, but now that are your key go-to people professionally. Do you have colleagues that you network with or thought leaders that you follow externally to our campus? You don't have to even know them personally, but they're your go-tos who you learn the most from, who you check out what they're talking about, what are they saying for professional purposes. And then the bottom dark blue box, is still on the professional side, but now back to internal. So who are your key go-to people here at work um, that you go to for professional problems, for brainstorming, um, for just talking about what you're doing at work? Who do you learn from here? So I'm just going to give you a couple minutes right now to just jot names down in each of those boxes, at least five names in each box. Now, as you look over the names that you're writing down, I want you to think about how broad or diverse is this group of people? Are they a lot like you? Similar background, similar demographics, similar work experience, worked in the same field, similar organizations? Or is it a broad and diverse mix of people? Because you are going to benefit the most the more broad and diverse your personal network is. You want a range of different kinds of thinking. You want people with different backgrounds and experiences than you. They will inform how you look at the world, how you approach problems, not people that just think exactly like you. That's not going to broaden you. It's not going to expand your horizons. It's not going to help you to learn. So you really want to pay attention to who's in your network and deliberately try and expand it. Today is a fantastic day to do that. Use the opportunity as conference with 500 staff from all over campus who do all different things. Um, to introduce yourself and get to know as many people as you can. Exchange business cards or contact information. Add people that you follow on social media. So make deliberate efforts, not just today, but ongoingly to broaden and diversify your network. So the next topic to talk about today is curation. As I said, curation is a really hot topic. The professional association for people in my line of work, learning and development, is called the Association for Talent Development. I just went in May to their international conference. I actually was lucky enough to present at their conference. And there were several sessions on curation. This is a really, really big topic right now. And people are talking about, for people in roles like mine, that we have to become curators. It's a new skill set that we have to have to curate content and information for the people that we're serving in a learning role. And I would suggest that all of us need to become curators in our own lives. Um, because again, of all the content that comes at us, we need to be sorting it and making sense of it. And that is a curation function. So curation, the definition of curation, is the act of finding, grouping, organizing, or sharing the best and most relevant content on a specific issue. Now, I've listed here five different types of curation activities. 
There, there are other ways to do curation as well, um, but just to give you a sense of the range of ways that you can curate. Aggregation is the, the idea of gathering and sharing relevant pieces of information from a wide variety of sources. So they get aggregated, they get pulled together into one place. So you might have a topic that people are interested in and you're pulling the content for them from different sources. You're sensing what would be most meaningful and useful and you're sharing that back out. That's a type of curation, that aggregation function. Filtering is another one that is just, again, sharing only the resources that are the most useful and relevant. With aggregation, it might all be out there. Filtering is that next level of then sifting it, filtering out for what would be most helpful. Elevation is looking for larger patterns in information. Something that's become very, very popular in the last few years are infographics. Has anyone here ever designed an infographic? Okay, a few of you. So infographics are popular and they're great because what they do is take a lot of data points that by themselves are not gonna be very meaningful to people and in fact may really overwhelm and confuse people. But you take them and you pull them together in such a way that you visualize them in an infographic to tell a story. You're using them to help make a point you wanna make, to sell somebody on some idea or concept or need, um, to tell a story in a compelling visual way. So that is an act of curation. You're curating this data to find a useful way to present it depending on who your audience is and what you're needing to use the data for. Mashup is the idea of merging two or more seemingly unrelated concepts, but you bring them together. And this has been the source of all kinds of new products, new innovations, is this notion of mashup. It's like, hmm, well, if I take that thing over there and this thing over here, th this makes an interesting new thing. Um, and so there are people who are always thinking like that and looking for those synergies and bringing things together. And then chronology simply is the act of taking a lot of different information and organizing it in a chronological fashion. So again, it's easier for people to follow it and make sense out of it. Now there are a wide number of curation tools out in the world. This is a sampling of some of them. And these are just the images that you probably recognize on most of these tools. So the W in the circle there is the image for WordPress. WordPress is a blogging tool that curates blogs. It's also a website tool. The Wisdom Cafe is built on WordPress. The F in the box is for Flipboard. Flipboard is an online customized magazine app. So this is one of my favorite apps that I was turned on to um, that I have on my phone. And Flipboard lets you choose whatever topics are of interest to you wide ranging, any kind of topic in the world you can think of that you're interested in, and then print media sources that you'd like to get that information from. And what it does is it pulls those things together for you on a 24 seven basis. It's constantly refreshing with the latest, newest headlines and information. So right now I'm obsessed with our political situation and following what's happening all the time. And so politics is the number one topic for me. And I go to Flipboard every day and I look at you know, what's, what are the latest articles and blog posts um, being written about that from all kinds of different sources. And it's just right there for me. Anytime I have a chance to go look at it when I'm writing BART, or waiting for a meeting, I can get caught up on the latest news or information on something I'm interested in. So I love Flipboard because you get to tell it what you want to know about. Um, so that is a curation tool. Um, Twitter, hopefully you all recognize, of course, curating different people's thoughts. Um, Scoop it, I'm going to come back to in a minute. YouTube, so we talked about this already, the second uh, most common search engine in the world, but obviously a curation tool for videos. So originally just music. Right? But now they've broadened that to anything that is in that video format. Hootsuite. Anybody heard of Hootsuite? Does anybody here have a job or a role that involves marketing or communications? Okay. So Hootsuite is a great thing for you to know about because what this does, Hootsuite is a content aggregator. And you can take um, a variety of different um, messages, let's say, that you're preparing in a communication um, of something. And you can set them all up to go out using different media channels and on a schedule. So you can have different pieces. So this thing you wanna go out on Facebook at this day and this thing you wanna go out you know, on Twitter and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a content aggregator that you use to schedule your own communications. Instagram, I'm sure you all recognize, also a curation tool for images. 
and the P for Pinterest. Now, Pinterest, I always thought of as something that just people who are artsy and craftsy, who is definitely not me, would, would use, and it would not have any professional relevance. Um, and I couldn't even imagine how I could ever use it for personal relevance um, until I was planning my wedding not that long ago. And everybody kept saying, you have to go to Pinterest to get ideas for your centerpieces. And you, you, know, pin, you need Pinterest for this thing and that thing. Like, that, it was so foreign to me. And I actually set up a Pinterest board. I was shocked at myself um, and actually found it very helpful. Um, but I heard from people who said that they use Pinterest. They, they find professional use for Pinterest. Um, and so I was curious to hear from you with any of these curation tools. I would just love if a couple of you just had examples. Pick one of these curation tools and how you use it to do your job. Anybody? OK, right over here, please. I'll be coming around with the mic. I had to do an icebreaker for a group meeting and found um, a lot of the exact icebreakers I was looking for on Pinterest. Wow. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, let's hear another one. Somebody else who uses any of these curation tools at work. Okay. We use WordPress to um, communicate out um, graduate division information um, in Grad News, which is a monthly newsletter. Okay. I also use it for the lectures I manage as a place for people to find out about lectures, sign up for the mailing list, and also view videos of lectures that have already happened. OK, great. Thank you. Let's have one more. One other tool that people use to do their job. I work at the Career Center, and so we do a lot of um, big group workshops. And so we use YouTube quite often to find good and bad examples of videos of interviewing skills, things like that. Fantastic and you always make sure they're fair use. <laughs> right. OK, great. Thank you for sharing those examples. So this is, you, know, you want to be creative in thinking about how can you take advantage of all the tools that are out there for you um, to make it easier for you to do your job, help you to be more effective and productive. So one of the tools that I use, I said I'd come back to, is Scoop It. Has anybody ever heard of Scoop It? So Scoop It is a curation tool, and it's at www.scoop.it. And what it does is allow you, on the free version, to have a Scoop It page on any topic you choose. I have a Scoop It page on social learning, because this is something I've been interested in and studying for a couple of years. And so I just have the free version. I have one topic, and I follow social learning. You can upgrade and have more premium versions and get as many topics as you want. I don't work for Scoop It. I'm not trying to sell it. But um, to let you know that. What you do is you have a page, and so for me on my social learning page, I am constantly looking for and coming across various resources, articles, blog posts related to social learning. If I think that they're good, I filter them, I curate. If I think that they're useful and, and worthwhile to keep, then I publish them to my Scoop It page. It takes about one second to do that. Now, if I was being a really good curator, I'd be adding a little comment to everything that I publish about why I find it interesting or useful and adding that extra part of value. I generally don't do that because I'm moving too quickly. But at least I have all this great stuff I've found about social learning that helps me to do my job all in one place. I keep finding that's a real challenge a lot of us have, is we come across a lot of great stuff, but we don't know where to put it. We don't know what to do with it. We don't want to print everything and have reams and reams and reams of paper that then we don't look through ever again anyways. But where do we store all these things, especially if you ever want to come back to them? So a scoop of page for me has been a great way to do that with social learning. Um, out of curiosity, when I was preparing this presentation, I looked to see how many people had pages on social learning. There are 339 people who are following social learning um, to publish their own pages on this. That's incredible. That just shows to me what a hot topic it is. Um, but you can go to Scoop It and search for me and follow my page if you want to see what I've already published. That happens to just be a screen capture of one part of my page. And I have, you can scroll through and get all kinds of information if you want to learn much more about social learning after today's session. So let's go to our next topic of social learning skills, and that's blogging. Why might you want to think about blogging? Blogging gives you a way to share your life and work experience with fellow professionals. It helps you become a better writer. 
You get to practice your writing skills in a way that people are really writing today, not the old research paper kind of writing that we had to do in school, um, but a new type of writing style. It helps, you can help and inspire other people by sharing your ideas and your thoughts with them. You can become more confident yourself of what it is that you know by thinking about what would I have to share? What, what is it I could write about? And you actually build some confidence realizing there's things that you could put out in the world. You can build your personal learning network through blogging because people start following you. It helps other people with their problems and challenges. Like I said, a problem or challenge you've dealt with, struggled with, you're not the only one. So if you're willing to blog about it, you can be helping all kinds of people and not even knowing who you're helping. And then you can leverage your knowledge and expertise to go way beyond what you're able to contribute in the course of doing your job, leverage that much more broadly by sharing it with other people. Now, how do you do this? So I have some tips for you. First, you want to write about your passions, your expertise, your skills, or solutions that you've discovered for yourself or tried out. And you need to focus on who is your target audience. Now, the Wisdom Cafe, as an example, is for our staff. It is a learning website for the staff of UC Berkeley. Now, of course, it's out on the World Wide Web, and that means anybody can find the Wisdom Cafe, anybody can read the posts and articles that are on the Wisdom Cafe. But I know that when I'm writing for the Wisdom Cafe or other people who write and submit blog posts for me, that those are intended for our staff audience. So you can have that focus in mind. And you want to think about, for your audience, what are they interested in? What would they need to know? What are their pain points that you might help address in what you would write about? And then just start writing. The greatest tip I've ever seen over and over and over, I've read blog posts about how to write blog posts, is pen to paper. Just the physical act of having an actual pen or pencil in your hand and actual paper. Of course, you can blog on a computer, but there's something in your, that happens with your brain that flows through your hand when you're doing the physical act of writing something um, that facilitates writing. And so if you're able to do that, that you can, and of course now we have voice dictation, there's all kinds of ways to get your, your words out, um, but the idea that it helps to just start trying to get something out and you'll see what flows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, and that's, I, I don't know, I don't have an answer for that, um, but I do encourage people to still get out the old pad and paper and, uh, and a pen and just try to write. Um, you want to structure your content. So similar to what we learned about how to write papers in school, you have a headline, you have an intro, you have a body. Often blog posts end with some kind of a call to action or some kind of a provocative question. A way to get people's attention is to include thought-provoking questions or stories or statistics or quotes. These are things that make your post more readable and get attention. To make it valuable and readable, besides those things, you also want to keep it short. Blog posts are not academic papers. They are not dense papers. They are short, easy to read, easy to get through. They're often bulleted. They are best when they have images. Um, and now video, of course, is extremely popular. And so some video, embedded video clips, short clips, um, can also help really uh, beef up your blog writing. Um, make sure that you edit and proofread your posts before you publish anything. We are the worst people to proofread our own writing. We know what our writing is supposed to say, and so we, we don't see the mistakes that we make. Um, always ask somebody else to proofread for you or edit for you what you've written. And then finally, be brave and actually publish what you've written and share it. If you want to write about what you do at, at your job, if you want to write your career story, if you want to interview a colleague in, about their career story, if you want to write about best practices in your department, there's all kinds of things you can write about you can send them to me, and I would publish them on the Wisdom Cafe. So you can start your blogging career now. Now there's a quote from a really well-known and, and very popular blogger named Maria Popova, who says, I really believe our own curiosity is our greatest and most powerful tool for personal growth. So what are you curious about? 
What's going to help you learn to learn the most is following your own curiosity. So what I'd like you to do now is just on any piece of paper, jot down five things that you are curious to learn about personally or professionally, just in your own life or related to work, anything that you're curious about, jot them down for yourself right now. One starter may be, what is it you want to learn today while you're here at this conference? Now to help you do something about those things you're curious about, to actually learn about them, I wanted to give you a very broad sense of some of the resources that exist in the world for us to learn from externally and internally. So externally, what this is is just a compilation that I made of a variety of sources that exist in the world to do learning of various types. So the first column is to expand your thinking. So to expand your thinking, you may follow people on Twitter, different people who are thought leaders or are provocative to you or think differently than you. And you may want to follow them and just get a sense of what people are thinking and talking about. You can follow people's blogs. You can get on Flipboard, as I talked about, or check out YouTube videos. To curate content, you can use Scoopit or other tools like Digo and Pinterest and Evernote. To educate yourself on all kinds of things in the world, you might watch TED Talks. I'm a big fan of TED Talks. I highly recommend them. And if you see a TED Talk that really inspires you, that's a perfect thing to share with other people. Let them know you, know, you saw this great talk, and they might want to check it out. I just happened to watch a TED Talk the other day. It was on something about um, consciousness in our brains and how our reality is not really our reality. It was really trippy. Um, this guy who's a neuroscientist did this thing. And somebody had suggested it to me. And, and then as I was watching it, I was thinking of somebody that I know in my life who I knew would totally geek out on this TED Talk. And so I sent him an email with the link. Um, the URL for it, and suggested it to him. Now, on his own, he probably would never come across that TED Talk. Um, but you know, I put it right out there for him if he wanted to check it out. Um, also, of course, books. Books still live in real form, in hardback form. Um, and of course, you can read them on devices as well these days. But books are still a great source of learning. Um, MOOCs. How many people know what a MOOC is? All right, that's a lot more than new two years ago when I asked that question. A MOOC stands for a Massive Open Online Course. And MOOCs are, for the most part, free classes that are out in the web from universities all over the world, from faculty all, from all over the world in every discipline you can think of, some who are Nobel Prize winners and all kinds of other prize winners, I mean experts in their field, who have courses out there that you can take for free. Now, our own campus, through the Greater Good Science Center, has a MOOC called the Science of Happiness. And when they put that out, they had a staggering number of people from all over the world who signed up for that MOOC. Um, and they're doing other MOOCs now, and other parts of campus are as well. But you can get um, MOOCs from Harvard and MIT and Singapore University and you know all over the place. Um, so check them out. They're a, fa a fantastic way to expand your mind. SlideShare. Does anybody know what SlideShare is? So another great tool you should know about, SlideShare is where people can share presentations that they've created as open source material. So you can go to SlideShare. If you're needing to put a presentation together on something or you're just wanting to learn about something, just search for it and see if there's any SlideShare is already out there, presentations people have already created. Maybe they've presented them at conferences or some things like that. And they're just there for you to check out for free um, and to use. So SlideShare, I've found topics like very wide ranging topics and they're, and they're already there for you. Um, and then if you just want to listen to different sources to learn from, there are podcasts. Podcasts is probably the hottest new medium that is out there. Podcasts on all kinds of things, um, personal related things. There's murder mystery podcasts. I mean, there's whatever your interests are, you can find a podcast for it. And those are fantastic ways to learn as you're commuting. If you have a commute that involves mass transit or you're in your car, um, you can't be reading blog posts, but you can be listening to podcasts. Uh, thought leaders, listen to thought leaders. 
and both internal and external in your field, and listen to colleagues and also competitors. What, what are people talking about out in the world that are indicators of disruptions and change and how things in your field are, are changing right now? What are the hot things that are going on that you should know about? Now, internally, we also have an ecosystem for your learning as staff here at Berkeley. So I kind of created this model. This is our staff learning and development ecosystem, and it has three bands. In the outer circle is the context that we are all in as staff members working here. We have the organizational culture of this place. UC Berkeley has a culture. And there are things about the culture that help us do our jobs more effectively, and there are things about the culture that hinder that. Um, but there is a culture that we all have to live and work within on our campus. There are all the people that make up this organization, our whole big broad community that Carol talked about this morning, of staff, of faculty, of students. We have all the people that we interact with and can learn from. We have a wide variety of resources at our disposal here. And then we have the jobs and the roles that we all do. So that's the context that we operate in to try and learn um, for ourselves every day. Now this inner band, the middle band, is the methods. And there are a wide variety of methods for you, for your professional development and learning, that you should be thinking about and doing something about regularly. At the top, we have development opportunities. So within the course of you doing your job, there are ways for you to learn and grow and develop. By taking on stretch assignments, by doing a cross-functional team, by working on a new project, um, all kinds of ways that you can learn as part of ongoing development in your job. Feedback is another critical method for your learning and growth. And that does not just mean the once a year formal conversation that you have with your manager for your performance review and getting that feedback. What I'm talking about is feedback that you're going out and asking for. That to be a learner in your own life, to be growing all the time, you need to be asking people for feedback. And go to different people, not just your manager, but it's great for you to ask that for your manager all year long, not just at the once a year performance check-in time, regularly. But go to your colleagues. Go to your customers. Go to people who are in a process chain with you. There are a wide variety of people we interact with, and it's great for you to just say, you know, I would love it if you would just give me a little feedback on two things that you think are real strengths of mine that I should be leveraging even more. And what are two ways that you would suggest that I expand and grow some more? Simple questions, and people really respect your vulnerability and your willingness to ask and seek feedback from them. So I encourage you to do that. Online is another method that we have for our ongoing development. We have online learning, and especially right now with lynda.com. Um, we recently entered into our license with Lynda, and so through our learning center, we have thousands of lynda.com courses and videos that are available to you absolutely free. So if you haven't been on lynda.com yet, you can go through the Wisdom Cafe to access it and build your own playlist. Check out what's there. They have a whole giant library and build a playlist that you can get to whenever you can and watch a, a video or uh, take a whole course. We are going to continually feature recommended videos from lynda.com for you on the Wisdom Cafe, and there's some right there now on the homepage. Coaching and mentoring is a great way for you to continue to learn and grow, um, and that, again, can be formally through um, using your manager as a coach or having a mentor through the BSA Mentorship Program, for instance, but it could also be informally. Just people that you trust, people that would give you good advice, people that would be a mirror for you to help you grow, seek out coaches and mentors in your career. Social learning, of course, we've been talking about in this session, and there are many ways for you to engage in that on our campus through communities of practice, through participating in staff organizations, et cetera, and then formal training. And of course, people think about formal training when they think about their development in an organization, and we, of course, have a lot of formal training for systems and technology and things like that. Um, and for functional development, if you're a student advisor or if you're a research administrator, for instance. Um, but your opportunities to learn and grow here go way beyond just the formal training classes, and we want you to think really creatively and broadly about how to pursue them. Now, the whole inner band here is all of the actual opportunities that currently exist for you. And I bucketed them in four categories of professional development, manager and leader development, networking and peer-based learning, and career development. 
And you can see the specifics in each one of those categories, um, many things that exist for you in our ecosystem of staff learning and development. And so it's really on you to take responsibility for your learning, for learning to learn and continuing to learn on a regular basis by knowing all these resources that are available and pursuing them. Now one of the great resources that we have is the Wisdom Cafe. And I just want to feature a couple of highlights for you from this site. Let me see if this will work. Yay. OK. How many people have been on the Wisdom Cafe? All right, let me try that the other way. Has anybody never been on the Wisdom Cafe? Oh, my god. OK. Um, well, I hope I'm going to get to turn you on to it right now and that you'll go check it out, which you could be doing right this very minute on your phone or on any device you have with you, uh, because we really want, to know, want everyone on our staff to be aware of the Wisdom Cafe. This is a website that was built for you. It's two years old. It was built as a learning platform for our staff. And it has a wide variety of different resources and information that we feature here. There are a couple things I want to highlight for you. Um, one is this login register button right here. Um, and if you go ahead, uh, oh, it didn't go. Oops. Okay. Sorry. All right, I'll keep talking while she tries to fix this for us. I thought I had it up, sorry. Um, so if you log in, there's a login button on the home page. Um, it takes about one minute to fill out a user profile. And if you do that for us, then we have you as a subscriber to our site. And we will, thank you, occasionally um, send you a newsletter that has a lot of new content that we're featuring on the site just to bring your attention to it. We don't slam your email inbox. Uh, don't worry about that. But it helps you to stay informed of what's new on our site. Um, and so that button, again, is just right here. If you've never logged into our site, please, please, please do so. Um, this is one of the things that's relatively new on our site. Right here, this learning resources button on the top right corner. And I want to show you what we have on this page. So we built a page to try and capture all of the different learning and development opportunities that exist on campus through Central Human Resources and from other organizations and departments on campus, um, like equity and inclusion and like our staff ombuds office and our faculty staff programs at the Tang Center, et cetera. There are all kinds of things here. And every one of these is a live link that if you clicked on it, you would get all the details you need to know about what is there for you, what's available for you. So we try to get past where we have staff saying, I have no idea what's available for my learning and development um, as a staff member here. We have so much, and we want you to know about it so you can take advantage of it. Now, what we've also built onto this page is a training calendar. If you click on the calendar, we are this is updating constantly um, with actual training courses that are coming up um, on all kinds of things. If you go to this drop down, you'll see that we've bucketed them by topics. So if you're looking for you know, what might be available for me on career development, you can search for that. If you're interested in multicultural education, you can search for that. So you can do it that way, or you can search the calendar itself, or you can just scroll. And we have all kinds of classes technology classes and the upcoming new employee orientations and everything else, and it just keeps going and going and going so that you would be aware of all the training that's out there uh, and that's coming up so you can sign up for it on the Learning Center. Um, once you've logged into the Wisdom Cafe, you're already authenticated in the system, and then when you go to the UC Learning Center or you go to elearnlinda.com, you don't have to re-authenticate. You're already in those systems. You're good to go um, to start exploring what's there or to register for a class. So we want you to be aware of, of all these great resources and take advantage of them. And then I want to point out on the community page that we do have a discussion board here called the Curiosity Corner. And this was put in place for you to have a place to talk to each other. As I said before, this is such a broad, spread out campus. We're so siloed. It's impossible to know each other. So we wanted you to have a place to talk to each other. If you have a question for your fellow staff, beyond the staff that you see and work with every day in your own unit, post the question to the discussion board. If you have a, an idea, if you have a solution, if you have a best practice, this is a place you can share it. And so 
we want this to start taking on a real life and, and get active and have people really using this on a consistent basis. It's always up there and it's for you. Um, the focus of the whole Wisdom Cafe and our Curiosity Corner Board is learning. So we're trying to keep the questions and the conversation to be learning focused. Um, so anything that you can share in that realm or ask people about in that realm, then we would love to have you participate with us. And I just want to go back to the home page for a minute. And here we have our Now Conference live blog. So let's try and get that open. Here we go. So we set up a live blog for today. And we are using the hashtag Wisdom Cafe now. Um, and we would love for you to be tweeting and Instagramming throughout the day um, to our live blog, sharing it with other colleagues who are here at the conference. If you hear something really inspiring from a presenter or something you want to remember, tweet it out because that means it's memorable and would be interesting for other people as well. Um, or take a photo and, and share that. Um, throughout the day, be a contributor to our blog. Let's see. All right, let me get back to my presentation. All right. All right. So I have a question for you now. What do you have to share with your colleagues? To practice personal knowledge management, to practice being a social learner and a sharer, what do you have to share? Now, if you think about all these categories, you might have a tool that you use that you can turn other people on to. You might have information that you've come across and other people aren't aware of. You have ideas all the time for how things could be done better in your department or an idea to solve a problem. You have tips that you could give other people as, a, as if you were coaching them in an informal coaching relationship. You might have content knowledge, content expertise in a particular area that you can share. You might have solutions that you've discovered to problems, as I said, that other people are dealing with and that would really help them out. You may have built up expertise, wisdom over the years of you being in your field and doing your job. You have knowledge that you've acquired. You have answers to questions other people have. And you even have questions that other people might find provocative and spur innovative thinking. And what I'd love you to do is get into a group of four. Just huddle up with four people around you and talk about each of you coming up with one thing from any of those topics, any of those different areas, one thing that you know that you could share with your colleagues. Now imagine that we had a UC Berkeley TED stage and you were tapped on the shoulder today sometime during the conference and asked to go on the TED stage this year for a 10 minute speaking slot. Now we don't really have a UC Berkeley TED stage but I think that would be cool if we did. But imagine that you're asked to speak about something to your colleagues for 10 minutes. Now, I would put money on it that every one of you would have something you could talk about for 10 minutes that would be useful, something that you know that not everybody else knows, that you could share. So I want you to stretch your brain right now and really think about what is it that I have to offer? What can I share? What's a tool I use every day in my job? Or what's something I know that I would want somebody new coming in to know? So huddle up in a group of four, and each of you come up with one thing that you can just talk to each other about and introduce yourselves. OK, thank you. Can I get two brave people who can share what, something you thought of that you could share with your colleagues? Two examples? OK, please. mentioned the MOOCs yes. and uh, Berkeley's part of edX yes. and I'm going to take a course in Mandarin that's going to help with a work trip I've got in October. Oh fantastic. Great. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And another example. What did you come up with that you could share? Come on, one more. 
All right, she's coming with the mic. I wanted to share about a tool I actually learned from my um, doctorate program in ed educational leadership. It's called nonviolent communication. And, um, you know, basically there's a lot of tension a lot of times in our meetings between faculty, staff, and sometimes students. And so this is an approach how to express your feelings and needs. Um, and even being able to hear the word no and be okay with that. But um, everybody coming from the same foundation, um, you know, just because you're a faculty member doesn't mean you're right. Just because I'm a staff member and I might be talking to a student doesn't mean I'm right. But a way to, you know, come to a compromise and be able to communicate in a way that's not contentious or, um, you know, full of anger or, um, and be able to come to resolution. So that's a, a tool that I've learned to use, and I actually shared some of that with my um, fellow staff members, and so I hope that we can incorporate into more of our meetings. All right, fantastic. Please, one more. Um, our discussion focused actually on how one makes time mm. if these are um, opportunities to learn or expand your knowledge set, mm -hmm. how to incorporate it into your day if you're really busy. So this is all fine and good, but mm -hmm. how do you integrate it? And how do you get buy-in from other staff or management to actually spend time doing this? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, actually, we are going to this year require that every staff member have as part of their um, goals for next year, a development goal as one of their goals that gets listed. So that that forces the conversation at least to happen with you and your manager um, around what is an appropriate development goal for you right now, what are you interested in pursuing and learning for you and your career and to contribute more in your job. And so at least that hopefully is a, a starter of that. Um, we also do teach our supervisors and managers in our classes um, how important it is for them to support the development of staff. And there are policies as well that promote staff development. Every single one of you is entitled to 40 hours a year of paid leave for your development. And most staff aren't even aware of that. So, um, so we're always working that, that issue so that it is um, recognized as an important priority um, that every member of our staff and manager community here are actively engaged in their own learning um, all the time and that we encourage that and promote that and support that as an organization. Please. Thank you, I'm sorry. I appreciate everything that you've been going over with us this afternoon. Is there a way that you can share your presentation to us? <laughs> um, I know this might be putting you on the spot. Or, no, but, not at all. Thank you for that. Um, it, actually, it's being recorded. So it'll be available um, along with many other sessions at the conference today um, up on the NOW website. Um, it'll take, uh, it usually takes about six weeks or so for ETS to do all the processing of the videos. Um, we will send an email to every one of you when they're up so you, with the URL so that you'll be able to go check out for any sessions you're not able to attend today and anything you'd like to see again. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, the slides are up on the website already. So if you just want to get to the slides, you, you're welcome to do that. Um, our own version of SlideShare. So I want to thank you so much. Um, I think... We, we have it. Was there a hand? I don't want to miss out on it. Okay, I, there's a hand. Let's please bring the mic. Thank you. So this may be slightly unrelated, but we're on the topic of tools. I yes. was wondering, is there any tools available for uh, maybe helping with communications with emails? Sometimes I get emails that, yeah, not quite professional. Mm. <laughs> so just across the board, if there's any access to help. Um, we don't actually teach a class on that per se. We have had some blog posts on the Wisdom Cafe about that, uh, about effective communication strategies. And there was a post that was specifically about email tips for emailing, being more effective with that. Um, funny, don't you have something that you did at Haas around this? Uh, can you get the mic, mic to her, please? We have um, one of our um, teams at Haas a couple of years ago did a video about um, how to be a, a good email sender, and it was uh, pretty awesome. So maybe 
Is it on the Wisdom Cafe I somewhere? We had, had yeah, there yeah. The yeah. It's it's really good to watch and um, helpful tips. Yeah. Um, how to be a, a a better email sender? I think yeah. So there's social learning right there. Haas created something great. Other people have a need for it. They were willing to share it on the Wisdom Cafe, and now any of you have access to it. That's a perfect way to wrap this up because it's a fantastic model of what I've been talking about today. I really appreciate your time and being here at the conference and at this session. And I encourage you to go forth and learn um, today and in your life. Thank you for being here.